everybody, and welcome back to the Library Podcast, Doc Talks, News, and Views. And today, we're here with another librarian, somebody when you come to the library that you see. this We're here talking today with Diane Richmond, and we are talking about backyard burning. Burning. It doesn't <laughs> sound good. How do we will be talking about... <laughs> We will be talking about, because Doc Talk's a lizard and he has nothing to do with birds, but we're going to be talking about birds. Mm. He, birds. She, she wishes she could fly. Oh. So, I, I'm curious, Diane. You're a birder. Oh. Yes, I am. Okay, and tell me. I just want to say thank you to Katrina and Deb for having me here today. Uh. This is delightful. <laughs> um... Yes, I'm a backyard birder. I, I do backyard birding. I do birding everywhere I go, actually. Um, I'm looking in the, in the air or in the trees or wherever, on lawns, it doesn't matter, for, for birds. I just, I can't help but notice them and see them. So I enjoy birds very much. And I do, um, I have a sister-in-law who's also, she's a, a really good birder. And I've been out with her on a number of occasions. I am more of a casual birder. She is a hardcore birder. Um, and I have been with her uh, last year. We went to, where did we go? It was a, a place near her house. And I got to her house at 4.15 in the morning. And we were at the birding site by 4.30. And we were looking for warblers <laughs> who enjoy being on the tippity tops of trees as the sun is coming up and just hitting them. So we stood for a half hour with our necks looking up, waiting to see movement in the trees, which we did. And it was actually, it was very fun, it was very cool, but I did need a nap that day. <laughs> <laughs> so warblers, and those aren't birds that live in our backyard all year round, right? Those are the birds that migrate? Yes, they are okay. very seasonal. Um, they start coming to this area around this time. And the best time to see them is before the trees leaf out because they do spend a lot of time in trees kind of high and they're smaller um, and I am terrible at identifying them because they are, some of them are very distinctive and that I can do, but a lot of them are very subtle. There's very subtle differences. My sister-in-law just nails it every time. Um, so I, I like going with her because she really? can tell me exactly what we're looking at. And she knows their calls as well, which I am also not super great at. I know some, but I do not know as many as she does. Okay, so let's start with somebody. So somebody who's listening to this podcast right now, maybe you're like me and in this beautiful, when the weather starts getting nice, I take my coffee out on my deck every morning and I take a look and I try to see the birds in my yard. Now I know... You know, the robins and the jays. I live on the edge of a floodplain, so I have lots of woodpeckers and finches, and they are frequenting um, my backyard. Um, but, I mean, I, I have looked up in the trees. This is why I wanted to do this podcast now, everybody, is because there aren't any leaves on the trees yet. So when I look way up high in the trees... I might see some of the birds that are just coming back from the spring because not all of our, like our cardinals and robins, they live here all year round. But So now this is the time of year when I start to see those spring birds, the warblers, for example. So I would look up, up high in the trees. Mm -hmm. And they're little, you just literally what colors look are they? in the tree. They, they range, there's uh, black Bermian warblers that are just spectacular. They've got orange, and I wish I had my book here so I could be specific. There's some yellow, some orange, some black. There's black and white warblers. There's warblers that are grayish blue. And I wish I could tell you all their names and what exactly they look like. But as I've said, I'm what makes them a warbler? Them. Like, how would I know if it was a warbler? Is it because of the sounds that they make, or it's I just grab a book from the library? I, you know, warblers are a particular group of birds, species of bird. And okay. They're sort of small. There's, um, I'm trying to think. This is not really a. I do not know that much about warblers. I really don't. Okay. So probably I can't go much farther than this. Because <laughs> I can't, yeah, I'm not, I can't 
Okay. Well, you already know, yeah, you already know more than me. Uh, so you mentioned a book. Do you take a book with you wherever you go? And I, If I go birding, I do take my book, and I take my binoculars. Okay. Um, and the birding books are terrific. There's Audubon, there's Peterson, there's Sibley. Um, I think Audubon, I believe, I can still get those, are all photographs of birds, and they're categorized, at least they used to be, by color. So if you are really just starting and you have no idea what you're looking at, but you go, it's red, you can just go to the red section and flip through. And it, I found that really helpful when I first started um, looking at birds. Well, that's exciting to hear, Diane, because all of those books are in our library. Ah, all of them. Um, <laughs> so anybody who wants to take a look and see what's flying around in their backyard can come down the library and check out one of those books. We have lots of them, too, mm -hmm. actually. I have one at my, my house that does work that way, not so much by color, but it's there's a chapter that says Common Backyard Birds, and then it'll say Thrush, and then you can go to the chapter and see what kind of thrush it is. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you, based on the book and my limited knowledge, that when I go out on my deck, I see wrens mm -hmm. and I hate the house wrens I have to say and I'll I tell you why house, well you can have all my house wrens because my house wrens make homes in my potted plants because <laughs> I have a few that I don't have plants in my house because my cats eat them and I don't have plants hanging outside because now the house wrens have decided that this is a good place mm -hmm. for their nests so while I do want to encourage birds into my yard, I'd want to discourage them from building homes in my plants. So if I want the birds in my yard, I think I would have to encourage them to come by giving them a good place to rest, mm -hmm. whether it's a home or bushes or yep. things like that. And of course, the big thing is, right, we feed the birds. What do we feed our birds to encourage them to come in? How do we do that? Do we need this big elaborate thing or... Um, there's a couple of ways to feed the birds in your backyard. One is easy, it's to get a feeder, um, and there's a number of different types of feeders that will attract different types of birds. Hmm. There are tube feeders, which are good for attracting finches, sparrows, chickadees. Um, they're usually seed mixes. Um, there's suet feeders that attract woodpeckers, nuthatches, starlings, and also squirrels. So you kind of have to be careful where you hang it because you won't get any birds. You'll just have a squirrel hanging there 24-7. Um, <laughs> there are ground feeders, which I happen to see on the internet. I have never used those. Um, apparently they attract cardinals, grosbeaks, and blue jays. Um, but I have what's called a hopper feeder, which are the type of feeder that you pour seeds into and they come out the bottom. So birds can land on the little perches around them and as they pull the seeds out, more seeds come down. Um, and a lot of those seeds end up on the ground. So you do get the ground feeders, which do tend to be cardinals. Um, they say blue jays, but I get a lot of blue jays on that feeder. Um, you get chipping sparrows in the summer. They feed on the ground. Morning doves feed on the ground. Juncos in the uh, winter months. As soon as the juncos come, the, they're black-eyed juncos. That they are the harbinger of winter. They're not huh. there all summer, and as soon as they get there, you know, oh my god, there's no turning back. It is huh. winter, absolutely. But they are also brown feeders. Um, I think it is, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but I think it's white throated sparrows. They also feed on the ground. Um, and a few other ones that I'm forgetting, but also you get chipmunks and squirrels, and turkeys sometimes come in. I have used through the years a number of different feeders. The last few years, this one has worked the best. The, the It's called a Sky Cafe feeder. And I fill it with black sunflower seeds, black oil sunflower seeds, because most of the mixes that we use had black oil sunflower seeds in them. And that's all the birds would eat. And then everything else would go to waste. Go everything else goes so on that right. I just decided, yeah. all right, we're just buying the black oil. So, mm -hmm. Those attract lots of different birds. I mean, and you feed them all year round? I do. See, I only put my feeders up like November and then I just took them down last week. Okay. So because of the mass. 
actually oh. all the seed casings and everything because yeah. my feeders are in the garden oh. um yeah. yeah so that's how i do it okay. and is that okay i mean what should i do for my birds in the summer i'm like the bugs are hatching eat those that's, that's right. how i feel well that's <laughs> that actually is correct so you can leave it up all year many people do my sister-in-law we've been having burger leaves hers up all year um i believe maybe she'll listen to this and say no i don't i take it down but i'm sure she does leave it up all year um you can also take it down once the seasonal birds have left for the summer to you know move up north a little bit you can put the feeders i'm sorry take the feeders off um out uh, yeah that's what i was trying to say take the feeders out i'm sorry take them out off off of their pr Thank off you. of their hangers off their hangers and, and clean them all them out clean them up and be done with that for the summer or you can leave them up um, the time of the year that birds have the hardest, um, it's hardest for them to find food is the, really the dead of the winter when the temperature is really cold and into the early spring because there's no bugs yet and there's mm. not as much food for them to eat. So if you want to put feeders up part of the year, that, that's the best. So I waited, a little, I should have keep them up a little bit longer. Um, I think, you know, at this point, yeah, it is fine to take them down now. Okay. I believe. Because there's things are just starting to bud and yeah, so yeah, I think that answers the question. Yeah, that's that's what I would do then. Right. I would continue. But but now in the summertime, do they need water? People always say I, I live at the edge of a swamp, so I don't really like to have standing water because it's just more habitat for mosquitoes. Oh, that's true. So like what? Okay. So what do you do? Like because people always say, oh, you need a bird bath. The birds need water. Birds do need water, but if you're near water, then you probably don't have to do that. But if you want to see them, um, I have a deck out um, in the back of my house, and I have a deck bird bath, so it attaches to the railing. Um, in the summer, I just have a normal one. In the winter, I have a heated one, um, because it, it, I feel like in the winter, they really do kind of need that. They they take baths in the feeder, uh, in the feeder, in the bath, bird bath, um, and it's actually, it's really cute to watch birds take baths. <laughs> <laughs> they're, really, they're really cute. Um, they get all fluffy and puffy and red, and they're just adorable. Um, <laughs> they also have a small pond that I dug out years ago when we first moved into the house. Um, and that attracts different kinds of birds because it's at the edge of the woods. We don't have huge mm -hmm. amounts of woods, but there's, we have you know some, some woods around. Um, Cat birds will come to that, which I don't like. They don't come to the feeder. They don't come to the bird bath, but they'll go to the little pond. Um, I'm trying to think of what there's been. Oh, the thrush. I've had thrush come to the pond. Um, I've seen turkeys down a pond. Um, and I get frogs. Every year the frogs come back. It just, it's really kind of cool. Um, so I I think it's really fun to have that. If you if you do do a pond, generally you have to have some kind of aeration. And so there's like a fountain, which will make a little water noise, which attracts animals, all kinds of animals. Okay. Um, I know something was eating my water lily plant one year because I would go out and in the morning, the, like half of it would be gone. <laughs> so I don't know what that was, but <laughs> it enjoyed it. I was attracted to the water yeah. and realized, oh, there's free lunch here as well. So if we provide food and we provide a water source, mm -hmm. then we will get birds in our backyard. What else? What else yes. would, can you put in your backyard for, for the well, birds to come? I was just going to say, um, the other two, well, on the, along the food lines, you can also, if you don't want to do a bird feeder, um, plant things, uh, natural habitat to encourage birds to come. Like certainly hummingbirds, there's lots of different flowers that attract them. I have some lists here if I can find that. Hmm. Um, okay. Let me see. Butterfly bush is one, which I love. I, I planted um, seeds a number of years ago, and they're kind of like a milkweed. So the seed pods come, and the, they float off, and every year they pop up in all different places, and I just dig them up and put them where I want them to go, or I just leave them. Um, so the bees, the hummingbirds, they absolutely love those. Um, there's things like uh, any kind of tubular flowers are good. 
particular red ones they like. Mm. Trumpet honeysuckle, cardinal flower, spotted impatience, Canada lily, native azaleas, and rhododendrons will all attract um, hummingbirds. Mm. Um, the other <coughs> kinds of things that you can use to attract birds are native grasses. So these are good um, because they have seeds, so the birds can eat the seeds in the fall. Um, things. Little blue stem. Yeah, little blue stem, yep. Switchgrass, Indian grass, in inland sea oaks, and blue grama are a couple of um, different grasses that you can use. Um, I'm trying to think. There's also autumn sage, lantana, salvia sage, um, and red bottle brush, which also attracts hummingbirds. Um, so all those kinds of things you can plant so you don't have to have feeders. Through the um, summer. Right. And there is actually, there's all sorts of books on the subject that you can, I'm sure, get at your local library. <laughs> um, there's also Mass Audubon has a website um, that will help you in your particular area to let you know what plants will thrive there and what will attract and these are natives as opposed to something you would just pick up at the Home Depot. Absolutely. So some of those plants you mentioned are annuals. So I stick those like in a, in a pot, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to putting them in the ground, the, the lantanum and yep. the, um, the mm -hmm. salvia. So you can kind of do a combination. You could plant yep. some of those natives, um, butterfly bushes, the rhododendrons and azaleas are evergreen bushes. So they always look good. Yep. Um, and then, you know, supplement it with some of those Home Depot plants that the hummingbirds like. My hummingbirds look forward to my, my um, oh, I went right out of my head the name of them. They're purple or pink. Fuchsia. Fuchsia. The hummingbirds, at least in my neighborhood, love my fuchsia, as does the house wren. So now what am I going to do with my house wren, Diane? I bought on the internet a house. Do you think it will like that over? I mean, just a, it's a little like grass thing woven that I thought was too small. And my husband said, no, no, your fuchsia plants were much smaller yeah, <laughs> even true. then. Well, I have two bluebird houses. In my okay. Backyard. I've had them there for years. Um, and I will just mention every year at the end of the season when all the birds have gone, um, I take out the nest, I shake it all out, get whatever I can get out of there. And then I do a little um, mild bleach um, water solution, and I just dip them in that and wipe them out, wash them out, let them dry in the sun, and then I put them back up. So that way, if there's any kind of parasite or anything in there, it's gone, and the next um, bird that comes will have a nice, clean house. Every year, the bluebirds come, and they, they just came about a week ago. They went back and forth. I looked out the window, I was like, oh, there's bluebirds. Oh, my God. Looked out the window, they went back and forth to the uh, to the each nest, and they they never opt to stay. And I think it's because it's not the right environment. Bluebird is yes. a larger like field area nearby. I've got a yard, but it's not big enough. But it's on the edge of a wood, so they kind of like that. But they never stay. Then the chickadees, who I adore, um, come in and they build nests in there, and then. A week and a half later or so, the house runs come and they kick the chickadees out. And they kick oh. the chickadees out. Yeah, the house runs are ridiculous. They, they are kind of territorial. And they're there every year, though. It is their mm -hmm. house, so I can't really blame them. And so then they make nests in there, and they do a couple of broods. And then we have robins that nest, which I did do a little investigating. And apparently you are supposed to take down the robin nest at the end of the season so that if you have, like, a gutter, or that's where they tend to mm -hmm. nest um, the, the angle of the gutter that hits the house, um, they make a nest there. So if you take down that nest, there's a greater likelihood that they'll nest again in that same place the next year. Um, and I also have the Phoebe that comes back every year. They just came back. And we always hear them before we see them. They make that sound. And they scream, Phoebe, Phoebe. And I just love having them. And they build these incredibly, they're so precarious. We have a, a door, or like a back door, and it's about maybe three quarters of an inch thick, and they built the whole nest on that little three quarter of an inch thing, and it comes out from the from the wall of the house, and and I just like every time I look at it, I just freak out because I and it has fallen. I mean, I've seen it fall, and 
they just rebuild it? They rebuild another place they like to build. We have a screened in deck, which we don't always screen it in before the freebies come because freebies are hand out and it's okay. not sitting outside. So one year I went outside and I noticed, oh my gosh, the freebie is building her nest on top of the light, which would be inside our screened in deck. Oh. So to take down the nest because we were going to put up the screens the yeah so bad, but then they went around to the other side of the house and built it where they usually build it so now i have uh, duct taped a can above the lamp so that they can't there's no room they can't put a nest in there so i don't have to worry about it hmm. <laughs> So anybody can do this, it sounds like. I mean, you don't need a lot. We, you need a guidebook if you want to identify the birds. Or you could just enjoy them without even identifying them. I mean, I thought I had bluebirds once, and it turned out that they, they were indigo buntings. Oh, my God. I have a... They are spectacular. They come every year. I see them for two weeks, and then I never see them again. They are the bluest of blue. Like the bluebird has a red chest. The indigo buntings are blue, all like blue. Easter egg to magenta blue, all, all shade of blue. In a, in a certain light, they do look but black. Them, and then they're this spectacular iridescent blue. It's a blue that doesn't even look like nature. No, it doesn't. It, doesn't. it looks like they were colored off. <laughs> They're, but they're beautiful, and it's a whole family that comes in one corner of my yard. They're there for two weeks, and then they're gone. I never see them again. And the same thing with the Orioles. Now, I want my Orioles to come and stay. And I know this is one of the reasons why I invited you here, Diane, because I, you told me what to do with my Oriole. My Orioles come either the weekend of or the weekend before Mother's Day. And this is when my apple tree is blossoming. And I get anywhere from, you know, one to two, although one year I did have many. And one morning when I wake up and I look out my window, I see them, and then I never see them again. The Orioles with the orange, they're yes, orange. They're, they're amazing. Now, they are, okay, so around this time of year, maybe a little later, as, you're, as you said, they do come. They are also in the tops of trees. Like That's what you told me. Look up. Yeah, and I, like my neck hurt all exactly. summer, and I've never seen them again. Well, you won't really <laughs> see them unless the leaves haven't moved out yet. So, okay. So, so now. So now, everybody, go out now and look at the go birds. Now, look up in the trees. And also you can listen for their call. And that's the other thing. Um, there are, I believe you have books. We do have books with the, call, yeah. So that you can flip to a page, hit the button, and it will give you, if you look at the bird, you can hear the call, so you can associate one with the other. So when you hear the call out in the woods or wherever you are, you can picture that bird. Um, I have yet to do that myself, <laughs> but but I, you can, my sister-in-law can walk into a wood area, and she can tell you seven different birds. Oh, that's the so-and-so. Oh, that's the Phoebe. Oh, that's the Peewee. That's the Whippy. Oh. That's, you know, such a and this is all by their sounds. Totally by their sounds. So, it's folks, amazing. we do have a backyard burning kit in our library of things, mm -hmm. and it does have, I believe, all the things you need. It has um, a CD, oh. so that's cued to the pages in the book, so you can do just what Diane is saying. Look at the picture of the bird and listen to the sound. And it also has a um, binoculars, a pair of binoculars. So I think those are the things we need, the guidebook, mm -hmm. the song, and yeah. the binoculars. And if you don't have a CD player, you can check one of those out from the Library of Things, too. So you'll have the entire kit and the CD player, and you'll be good to go, right? That is awesome. No, All right. Yeah. And the other thing I will mention about the books, um, and this was something that I just I sort of couldn't believe it when it happened for the first time. I was camping with my husband, and I had just started... Um, Sort of getting into birds, and there was a bird right near the website on the ground, and I, I thought, what is that bird? I don't know what it is. What is it? I gotta look it up. So it had two sort of stripes, white stripes, on the top of its head, and I, well, I was flipping through, flipping through, and it was about the size of a robin, and I. Saw 
sit on this bird. And I was like, oh, I think it's an oven bird. Oh my God, I think it's an oven bird. I've never seen an oven bird. And it said, oven birds. And it just described it, and it was exactly what I was looking at. And then it said, often seen um, kicking through leaf litter on the, on the forest floor. And that's exactly what it was doing. Wow. Exactly. So that's the other thing about guidebooks. Not only will it tell you what to listen for, what to look for, but also the behaviors. Hmm. You may, you know, it's happened to me numerous times that you'll be looking at a bird, you'll think, oh, I think that's a such and such. And they'll say, often seen, you know, in, um, you know, the lower branches of such and such a tree. And there it is. It's, and you're like, oh, my God, that's the tree. There's the lower branch. <laughs> so those kind of cues and clues that they give you are really helpful in the book. I, I, it's, like, it's like a scavenger hunt. You find something and you get it right and you just, it's very exciting. I really enjoy that. Mm. Mm. Oh, so that's just another little Another little hint. I love it. Well, we have a lot of kids and families in the children's room who love our scavenger hunts. So maybe this is another way to uh, yes. have a scavenger hunt at home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even do <laughs> Out in the wild. In the windows. Yes. I love it. Yeah. And I will say, too, there are, um, for people that can't really get out of the house um, but really enjoy birds, they have little bird boxes that you can stick to your windows. And they're open. When the birds come up, they sit on a perch. And you can see them through the house. So you can just, I forget, I'm not sure exactly how you get to see them. <laughs> but I know there's ways. I think you can just, I don't know if it's just on a lower level, but I've seen a number of. They sort of hang off your windowsill. Yes, and you can see them right through the window. And it's like they're right there. They're right there. It's really, it's a, I have a perfect window for that because I have a. Um, a lilac bush, I guess, that's grown, you know, it's not right up against the house, but it would be a barrier, so, like, the birds could, yeah. like, hang out there and think nobody's watching them, but I am, my, me and my cat. I was just going to say, my cats <laughs> Your would cats like that. would yes. love a bird box, right? I'll get right on that. They would love one. <laughs> so. Yes, I'll, I'll, give a, I'll give a plug if you have children that are interested in birding. There is a wonderful book, and it is called Bird Count, by my sister-in-law, Susan Beekman. So, and it's all about this little girl, Anna, and she goes out um, on a bird count, and you, I think she's with, there's two other people with her, because when you're on an official bird count, you need to have more than one person to confirm the sighting, and it, it sort of walks through, like, all the different things that you can encounter on a bird count, like, there's, uh, they saw geese flying up in the sky. There was five of them. And then a little ways on, sort of in the same direction the geese were flying, they saw five geese on lawns. And they decided those were the same geese that we saw, so we're not going to count them because we're pretty sure those are the ones that were in the sky. So we this is another opportunity. Before. This is another opportunity for um, citizen science Mm-hmm. There's lots of websites where you could participate as a citizen scientist, and there are. That's just, I guess, another way that you could have birding be helpful, mm-hmm. right? Through bird counts, because yeah. I know that that's something that you can do with bees as well. Oh, yep. That's yep. We should probably post that on our web on our web page too. So look for that at the end of this podcast. The links to our citizen science um, opportunities. Um, and then, if your backyard isn't that great for birds, I know mine is just because it happens to be where I live. Is there a, a good website or a place that you would suggest to go and actually look at these birds if they're not in your backyard? If they're not in your backyard, well. After I've I fed them and exactly. given them so houses, them and, and they're still, and they're still not there. <laughs> and what is wrong then with your house? What is wrong with your house? Absolutely. Um, or maybe I want to see different and more varied birds. Where would I go? The, locally. I know. Locally, I have, oh, right here. Um, in Northboro, there is Kearney Park, which yep. I have not but it is, um, I have read it's a good place for birding. That is also the unofficial dog park for our oh. listeners who have dogs. Oh. 
Kearney Park is the unofficial dog park in town. Right. So don't tell me. Yeah. <laughs> but that, the birds are there too. Okay. Um, Crane Swamp is another uh, good place, and certainly where there is water, there are lots of interesting birds. Um, if you've never seen a great blue heron, I mean, they are oh, around yeah. the area, and I mean, I've seen them. They're rather common, but they're they are. spectacular. They are. And if you're near one and they take off, just... It looks like a dinosaur it. flying. <laughs> it is. They're huge. Their wingspan is, is huge. I can't six feet, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and they're just spectacular. And you can watch them fish, which they'll just stand very still in the water for a long time until they see a fish, and then they poke their beak down, and they grab the fish and eat it. Um, and that's spectacular as well. I've um, seen great blue herrings around Lake Chauncey, oh, so that's okay. a good... And the swans. So those yeah, are the birds the that you can see there. And the swans. I don't know why they call them meat. They are quite um, loquacious. Boisterous. Boisterous. When they're flying. They're, <laughs> they call it because they fly. They love mm-hmm. flying. Um, Mount Pisgah is also another place which I think wooded areas, it's almost best in the morning, like early morning. Okay. Um, that is the best time because they're out and about. Um, and if you are up, early, like before the dawn, and you open up your windows in the spring or the early summer, you can hear the dawn chorus, which is also, I just think it's amazing, and you'll, it'll be perfectly silent, and then there'll be a one bird to make a little, you know, call, or whatever, and then another bird will walk, and then another bird, and before you know it, there's a cacophony of all different types of birds, all sort of calling out to each other, um, yelling at each other to keep out of their territory, um, just saying, okay, here I am, I'm awake. Are you guys up? I'm up. You up? <laughs> so how's it going? It's raining today. Yep. I don't I know, know really what they're saying. But, um, I must admit, I have heard the bird chorus a number of times in my life, not because I've gotten up early, because I was like, oh no, I've read until dawn. <gasps> but yes, I have. And it is wonderful, everybody. You know, you should, if you've never heard the dawn chorus, especially this time of year is when you yes. hear it, right? It's beautiful. Yeah. It is. It's truly beautiful. Yeah. And then we also don't want to forget about our night friends, um, owls. I mean, you don't. You don't see them a lot because they are nocturnal and they're out there like out and about doing their thing at night. But um, you can you can hear them, and we have had barred owls and great horned owls near our house, and from a fair distance away you can hear them. And I, it's usually in like January, I think December, January, where they they'll start mating that early because it takes. Um, a lot longer for their gestation period, mm-hmm. I think it is. I may be getting that wrong. But it's just, it takes longer to train for owls to hunt. And hmm. so they they need to start earlier to make sure that when they send them off on their own, they're not being in the middle of the winter and, and sending them off to certain perils. <laughs> <laughs> to certain perils. Yeah. So, but if, you, if you're out at night, just like we said, and the screeches too, the owls make, I never realized. I thought they just made those beautiful. No, that's the morning doves. The owls are the ones out there screaming. Yeah. They <laughs> all night long. And the hawks, we've all heard that we've, I, there are a lot of red tailed hawks in town all over Northborough. I've seen them. But you can hear them, and they you look at the bird, and then you hear the sound that comes out of them, and it doesn't connect, because they have this little, tiny, high-pitched squeal that does, yes. right, that does not scream. match this majestic no. bird. No. So they do it in flight. They do. They, yeah. they do it in flight. So, so yeah. Yeah, so the owls are spectacular, too. And there's also, I will just mention this, my sister, Laura Dunn took me on, I have never seen one, I know nothing about them, woodcocks. Um, they, they have this display in the spring when they're courting to courtship this bird. They have an incredibly specific um, a habitat that they need to have in order to do this whole mm-hmm. flight that they do. 
it, it needs to be kind of an open area with a, an area of bramble, which I don't know has to be a certain length, and it happened at a very specific time of night at dusk. So it has to be dark enough. It has to. I'm trying to get this right. It has to be dark enough so that the raptors won't see them, but light enough so that the owls aren't quite out yet. And they do this display where they fly up and they make this sound. And you think it's a call, but it's not. It's their feathers. They fly up in, I think it's sort of a spiral, and then they do this huge circle around where they're flying, and then they land, um, and they make this little peep sound, or little chip sound when they land. And that's how we got to see them up close because they landed and it was like, it was so hard to see because it was dusk. And someone had a flashlight, but you don't want to use the flashlight because you don't want to scare away. But we did manage to see them and it was, if you ever get a chance, I think Drumlin Farm does okay. have walks. And it, again, like it has to be right at like, you know, 720 to, you know, 8, 805 or something. It's, it's really, uh, it's a neat thing to see. So anyway, that's just another little very cool. That is yeah, very yeah. cool. It's a fun thing. All the little things you don't realize you're missing until you look up in the sky. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. Hmm. I cannot believe I haven't crashed my car yet. Because <laughs> so, so many times that I'll be driving around. Oh my God, that's a blah, blah, blah. Or there's a bald eagle. Or it's the, you know, usually the mm -hmm. raptors that are high up. And the, you know, right. Yeah. So. So. Well, thank you so much, Diane, yeah. for talking with us about thank birds you. today. I think we've learned a lot. Mm -hmm. it and was my pleasure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, anybody who's interested in any of the books or websites we've mentioned, you know, please check us out at the library. Is there anything we want to tell our listeners today about what's going on or anything special we've got planned for next month? I know oh. it's Poetry Month. I would encourage everybody to come in and check out a book on poetry. And Indeed. that's all I'm going to say because Indeed. it's one of those things that is so beautiful and so overlooked. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Doc Talks News and Views. I am Katrina. And I'm Deborah. And if you want more information, you can visit our website at www.northboroughlibrary.org or give us a call at 508 Three nine three five zero two five. We'd love to see you at the library. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>